Hello and welcome to my show, Shuvra Deb with you, with me, your host, Shuvra Deb. In this show, I will be discussing mental health with the aim of raising mental health awareness in our community and in society as a whole. The genesis of the show is my own pivotal life-changing experience of being in a Category 5 hurricane back in 2017. That experience led me to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. I am hosting this show in order to let you know that you are not alone if something life-changing has happened to you from which you are struggling to heal. Shuvra Deb With You focuses on a range of topics relevant to mental health and to raising awareness of issues surrounding mental health. Hello everyone and welcome back to Shuvra Deb With You, where I help you to prioritise and look after your own mental health and that of those around you who you love and care about. As you all know, and for those of you joining in for the first time, my show is about raising awareness around the topic of mental health. I want us all to be living in a society where looking after our own mental health and that of those around us is no longer stigmatised. I want us all to live in a world where we no longer make the distinction between mental and physical health and where each and every aspect of our health is considered in an inclusive way. Whilst my show is about raising awareness around the issue of mental health, I do want to make it clear at the very outset that I'm not a mental health professional and I'm not a medically qualified doctor. If you need to seek professional help, then I really encourage you to do so. And we have a great number of options here in the Cayman Islands for you to reach out for support. And I will run through those at the end of my show. To do a recap, last week, my show was called Isolation, Avoiding It, Dealing With It and Welcoming It for Your Mental Health. There, I discussed some different aspects of isolation and loneliness. I said that humans, by our nature, are social beings and the need for human connection is something that is within each of us. One of nature's ways of making us feel good is the release of the oxytocin hormone, which when released makes us feel all warm and fuzzy. And one of the best ways which allows the release of oxytocin is the company of another person. It's not always possible for everyone to get out and about and to connect with others, so one of the nicest ways to do that in this modern age is through something like social media. Facebook, for example, has lots of groups that you can join where you'll be able to meet like-minded people and connect with them. And if you join a group and it doesn't work for you, you can always leave that group and look for another and keep going until you find the right fit for you. I also looked at some of the ways in which we can combat isolation and loneliness, whatever stage we are at in our lives. For seniors who may be feeling lonely or isolated, here in the Cayman Islands, there are charities that organise events to keep people connected. For example, Prospect Red Bay Community Group is a source where you can find connection. The Pink Ladies also provide all kinds of services to seniors, including a Wednesday bingo on the first Wednesday of each month. That takes place at the Jasmine Villa off West Bay Road. Last week, I also spoke about isolation in young people, as well as when studying. Some of the things to do to help in that context are joining clubs and societies at college or university, or starting up a study club where you can study together with some of your fellow students. If you have time, another thing to do to gain connection is to work part-time, which could be in retail, in a restaurant or in a bar. Another great thing to do is to volunteer, perhaps in the college or university library, or at one of the college clubs or societies, or in one of the local charity shops or for a local charity. And on a more general level, if you're feeling lonely, one thing that you can do to combat loneliness and isolation are to acknowledge your feelings. Instead of being stoic or instead of denying feeling lonely, journal or write down your feelings surrounding your loneliness. By writing things like this down, we take the internal aspects of those feelings outside of us, and that creates a sense of separation from the sadness that your loneliness might be bringing you. It's a way of helping you shed some of that sadness. Reading an inspirational book is also something you can do if you're feeling lonely, even if you are feeling without purpose. Behind every story of inspiration and achievement, I can almost guarantee is another story of overcoming something difficult and of adversity. On episode 11 of my show, I discussed a book review of five books that I had read recently. 
And if you missed that show, it's available on my podcast, which you can catch on demand on Spotify, Apple, Google, and other platforms. Just search for Shuvra Deb with you. Of those five books, at least four of them are stories of inspiration and growth, or they contain stories within stories that provide tales of inspiration and growth, which will help you see that feelings of loneliness and isolation are temporary and that they will pass. I also spoke about when we want to welcome isolation, when we want to be by ourselves. And those are moments when we can enjoy our own company by either reading a good book or cooking ourselves a delicious meal. Time alone is also a great opportunity for meditation and a time to connect with spirit or with God and a time to spend on self-reflection. Moving on to my show today, given that Easter is just around the corner, can you believe that it's Easter already? I actually feel like it was Christmas just a few weeks ago. How time is flying. But given that Easter is just around the corner, today's show is called Easter Special, Time to Hit Reset. I will look at this from a few different angles. Firstly, I'm going to talk about some of the mental health issues that we can face at Easter time and at times of holidays generally, and what we can do to help ourselves with these. I will then look at Easter being a time of resurrection and being a time for renewal, rebirth and hope, especially with it being the start of springtime. Those of you who tuned in to my Christmas special on setting intentions will know that I spoke on that show about having weekly or monthly check-ins with where you are with your intentions. And for those of you for whom the intentions might have slipped away, or maybe you're now thinking about setting some new goals, in today's show I'm going to take you through some step-by-step -step exercises to help with those goals and intentions so that you have some real-time, real-life tips and tricks up your sleeve to help you maintain or to get back up to speed with the intentions that you set for yourself at the end of last year or new ones that you can set for yourself now. I'm then going to round off things with a subject I've touched on a little bit before in some of my other shows and that is how we can use fear as fuel. I will be talking about using fear as fuel in the context of fuel for making changes and for setting new intentions, either because you didn't get around to it at the end of last year, or because having set intentions for yourself then, you realise that those weren't the right ones for you and you're looking for something new to focus on that sits better with you, that aligns better with who you are and what you want. And perhaps the most exciting thing today is that we are going to be getting creative together. So if you're not driving and you're not out and about, go and grab two pieces of paper, just ordinary normal sized pieces of paper that you would use to print documents on and a pen or a pencil. And we are going to make something for ourselves today. And for those of you listening on the radio who want to come back to this, check out my podcast for your replay of this show, which lands every Tuesday at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Spotify, Google, Apple and other platforms. Starting off though, I want to look at some of the mental health issues that we can have at Easter time and at times of holidays in general. Some of these can be to do with isolation and loneliness, forced time off work due to the public holidays and the impression that everyone around us is spending their time with family and friends can make us feel bad. If you caught my recap just now of last week's show, you'll know that I spoke then about some of the ways in which we can combat feelings of loneliness. As I've already spoken about this, I won't dwell on it and I will let you head on over to the podcast for that episode. And I really recommend that you do have a listen as I have some really good tips for you that I think will help you. The holidays can be a tough time, sometimes due to the pressures we may feel to meet with family and friends and to share meals and to have time together. Whilst this may bring feelings of profound jubilation in some of you, for others of you, you may feel that you don't want to get into family dynamics or you may be feeling down about something and you don't want the pressure of having to put on a brave face or a forced smile amongst people with whom you are close. If you are feeling that way, then I encourage you to be gentle and kind to and with yourself. Prioritise your mental and physical health needs. If that means setting boundaries around when and with whom you will spend your time, then do that. Make it clear to your family or friends what times and what days you're available and limit your interactions to those times. That way, you know that there is an end in sight and that you are signed up to be somewhere for a limited period of time. If you do this, your family and friends may push back and ask why you can't spend more time with them. That might be because they're needy or it might be because they care about you and they like you and they want to spend time in your company. 
Either way, and whilst I always advocate for honesty, sometimes it is just too hard to tell people the truth about how we're feeling, and that we may simply not want to participate in all of the activities being offered. If you're feeling that way, there is no harm in having a story up your sleeve to tell people, if being Phoebe and friends is not for you on this occasion. That is saying, oh, I would if I could, but I just don't want to. Or words to that effect, for my fellow Friends fans who are listening. You may want to say that you have a project you're behind on and need to finish up, or that you need some hours to catch up on work, or that you're tired and you need to get more sleep. And then, if you do leave the company of your family or friends and you are feeling down, please do something like calling the local National Mental Health Helpline, which is the cost of a telephone call, and which is a great way to speak to someone who is empathetic and kind and who will lend you an ear and a shoulder. Just venting can sometimes bring about tremendous feelings of relief and make you feel just a little bit less burdened by your thoughts. Another great thing to do at this time of year, just as spring is arriving in the Northern Hemisphere, is to get out and take a walk in nature. It doesn't have to be a long walk. Just 20 minutes around your neighbourhood or your local park or along a meadow or a beach or a nature trail can really help to get you out of your head and to get your body and energy moving. If, on the other hand, you are the provider of the meals over Easter, that is, you're the host or one of them, this can also be a really stressful role to have. Easter can be a bit like a mini Christmas for some. The one thing to remember with this one, I think, is to avoid perfectionism. Trying to be perfect is tempting if you're making the food, for example. You want your food to be delicious and for your guests to be eating well. I know this one well because I put myself under this kind of pressure. Equally, I know the version of me who turns up to someone else's house for a meal and I know that I'm always hungry and ready to eat and enjoy what my friends have put together with care and attention. So, take some of the pressure off from the need to be perfect. Easter can also be a time that can trigger eating issues. One of the ways to deal with this is to set yourself some boundaries around food. Perhaps offer to spend time with people where meals are not the centrepiece. Maybe a trip to the local park or to the cafe for a cup of tea and a catch-up would be better than meeting friends or family for a meal. Or popping in on them after they have had their meal could be the trick. And if you are around food, maybe try to go to places or homes where food is served family style, that is, on platters where you help yourself so that you can have as much or as little as you would like, without feeling the pressure to eat or to not eat a certain amount of the meal. And also, try not to identify as being your eating issue. You are not the anorexia, the bulimia or the binge eating. Try to see the food issue as a trait, not as who you are. And if you're generally struggling with Easter time, prioritise self-care, using the days off as a time for me time. If you're feeling lonely, maybe set up a loose schedule that you can follow over the long weekend. For example, start your day with a walk or a workout, or start the day with a leisurely cup of tea or coffee and some time reading a book that you're enjoying, or a book that you've enjoyed in the past. Reread it, why not? Maybe listen to a podcast that calls to you, or watch your favourite programme. And then maybe take a walk out in nature, followed by a leisurely lunch, and then a nap or a hot bath in the afternoon, followed by a feel-good movie in the evening. The time will most likely fly by. It certainly does for me on days like the ones I have just described. Easter is also a time that is associated with and almost synonymous with resurrection. And resurrection doesn't only come in the religious sense. Let's look at resurrection from the perspective of reviving, bringing new life to, or resurrecting your joy, your passions, what you want out of your life. In this regard, I want to discuss with you the law of attraction. And before you all roll your eyes and groan out loud, I'm not talking about just simply thinking and believing positive things, which then causes some automatic switch to flick on, which then causes money or love or some other form of abundance to start falling out of trees as we traverse through the local parks, skipping with joy. No, what I'm talking about is Jack Canfield's actual approach to what he calls the law of attraction, which in my view has been oversimplified and misunderstood by some. Having said that, the following statement made by Canfield is true. He says... When you focus on the abundance of good things in your life, you will automatically attract more positive things into your life. But if you centre yourself on negative thoughts and only focus on what you lack in life, then you will ultimately attract negativity into your life and what you want most will continue to elude you.
Take parking your car as an example. If every time you drive into a parking lot and your first thought inside your head or even out loud is, oh, I'm never going to find a spot, I can almost guarantee to you that that parking spot will continue to be elusive. On the other hand, drive into that parking lot and think, oh, I know there'll just be the right space for me. Chances are that just the right space is there, either waiting for you to find it or as a result of someone else pulling out and giving you a space just in the nick of time as you pull up to that space and want to park your car. Think about it from this perspective. I think almost all of us know at least one person, that one person who is always having a bad day, who got caught in the rain again, who missed their train or bus again. The, oh, this always happens to me, person. The Eeyore in our lives. Eeyore being the fictional donkey character in A.A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh books who is always gloomy and ready to tell everyone all that is wrong with the world. You see, like attracts like. Energy attracts energy. On this, Albert Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared, means at its core, everything is energy. The longer version of this is, Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. The medium length version of this is energy and matter are interchangeable. In other words, energy and matter are different forms of the same thing. Everything therefore has energy and energy is everything. Einstein said of this himself, it followed from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are both but different manifestations of the same thing. A somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind, says Einstein. Applying Einstein's equation on energy to the law of attraction, at a basic level, greet someone with a cheerful hello. That cheerful disposition will be picked up by them. Even your Eeyore, everything is terrible person will notice it. Your cheerfulness might annoy them, but they will certainly notice the energy that goes with it. Now, take your cheerful hello to someone else who has a, a calmer or a happier disposition. Imagine that person is someone from whom you may need some assistance. For example, you're in a bookstore and you can't find the book you're looking for. Greet the store assistant with a cheerful greeting and inquiry about the book, and that person is more likely to go out of their way to locate your book for you and maybe even offer to order it in if it's not in store, and maybe even to give you a personal call on the telephone once the book arrives in store. And to round it off nicely, you have had a positive experience, they have had a positive experience. In setting out the seven principles of the law of attraction, Jack Canfield says this, It's important to note that the universe doesn't care what kind of energetic vibration you send out. It doesn't care if you are a positive or a negative person. It simply responds to what you offer. By changing your energetic vibration, you can change the way the universe responds to you. You can manifest particular outcomes in your life simply by creating and leaning into vibrations that align with your desires. But in order to do that, you must become deeply and continuously aware of your energy, thoughts and feelings and the seven different ways in which they shape your reality. Let me repeat that last little bit because I think this is really important. Canfield is talking about awareness, about self-awareness. In order to manifest what you want, he says, you must become deeply and continuously aware of your energy, thoughts and feelings. After all, we can only turn our attention to the right type of energy, thoughts and feelings in order to attract what we want by firstly becoming aware of what our energy, thoughts and feelings currently are. And secondly, by becoming what we desire those energy, thoughts and feelings to become. After all, we can only turn our attention to the right type of energy, thoughts and feelings in order to attract what we want by becoming aware of what our energy, thoughts and feelings currently are. And it is through awareness that we can start to manifest changes. In other words, if we want a boyfriend or a girlfriend, let's say, and our thinking pattern is, well, all the good ones are gone at my age, that thought pattern is only going to get you to meet happily married men and women. On the other hand, if your thought pattern is, I am glad I waited because at my age and at their age, we've messed this thing up enough times that we are going to get it right this time round. Think that and boom, someone may just magically drop into your lap. And if not that, at the very least, they may just walk through the door the next time you're sitting in a cafe or at a bar. 
And who knows, the two of you may even get talking. So, what are the seven principles of Canville's Law of Attraction? Number one is the Law of Manifestation, and this is where our energies, thoughts and feelings create our reality. Number two is Magnetism, which is that like attracts like. Number three is Unwavering Desire, and this is your true and unshakable commitment to what you are manifesting. Number four is Delicate Balance. Nature at work shows symbiotic balance. Just visit a rainforest or a meadow that has not been interfered with. The same is true of us. We are, after all, a part of nature. We must therefore have all aspects of our life in balance. That doesn't mean equal amounts of time and energy spent on everything. It means the required amount of time and energy spent on the right things, the important things. But more of that on another show, I think, as there's a lot I can talk to you about on what balance in life, life balance, actually is in truth. Number five is harmony, which is the flow of life. When we are in flow, life becomes easier. Canfield says that this is swimming with the current rather than swimming against it. Number six is right action, which essentially means, and to quote Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 of the Bible, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Number seven is universal influence. This goes back to Einstein's everything is energy. Humans physically are mass. We are all made up of mass. We are all therefore energy. And we have energy within us. And those energies interact with other energies, with other humans. Really, distilling all of that down, Canfield tells us that what we need is to ask, we need to believe, and then we need to receive. And I would add to that that we have to have the law of magnetism aspect covered too. You see, like attracts like. What we put out to the universe, what energy we put out, is what we get back. And in my view, once we have those more energetic parts on our side, we go about achieving by doing three simple things. Firstly, we identify our goal. Secondly, we identify what may be blocking us from reaching our goal. And thirdly, we devise and execute a plan of action to attain our goal. So, with all of that in mind, let's use Easter as a time to let go of the past and embrace new beginnings, an opportunity to reflect on our values, goals and aspirations. In my Christmas special episode, I spoke about setting intentions for what was then the coming new year of 2023. I spoke about how, in order to stay on top of and maintain our commitments to our intentions, we should have weekly or monthly check-ins to see where we're at. Easter is a great time, it being about a quarter of the way into the year. It's a great time to look at some exercises that will help with those check-ins, giving you some real-time, real-life tips and tricks to help you maintain or to get back up to speed with the intentions that you set for yourselves at the end of last year. For some of you, you've set your intentions, you've worked out a plan made up of bite-sized steps on how your intentions will be achieved, and every four weeks or so you've been checking in with yourself to see how you're getting on. And for others of you, you had really good intentions and you thought about some improvements and changes you wanted to make for 2023. Maybe you jotted these down on a piece of paper somewhere. But that piece of paper is lost, possibly forgotten about, and you've not been having the check-ins to see where you're at. That's okay, because I have the perfect step-by-step -step guide for you. Remember, every attempted attempt at something that doesn't quite materialise is a wonderful opportunity to have another crack of the whip. You can hit reset, refresh or restart any time you want, and you don't even have to wait until tomorrow for a new day to hit reset. You can do it right now, right this minute, with me. And if you are hitting reset right now, let's do it together. Let me take you through the reset steps. And remember, please only do this if you're not driving. And if you are driving, tune in to have another listen to this show on my podcast available on Spotify, Apple, Google and other platforms. The new episodes drop every Tuesday at 6am Eastern Standard Time. OK, so let's do this. Let's hit reset. Let's put Jack Canfield's Law of Attraction into action. The first thing to do is to identify precisely and exactly what it is that you want. Do you want to eat healthier? Do you want to have more space in your home or workspace and to declutter? 
Do you want to start meditating? Do you want to be calmer, more understanding, and less reactive to things that are said and events that take place? I want you to grab one of your two pieces of paper and I want you to write down just one thing that is preventing you, that is currently stopping you from achieving your intention. If it's eating healthier, are you stuck in a loop of eating comfort or junk foods and your body is craving those foods, making you feel like you have to eat those kinds of foods? If that's the case, write that down and remember that your mind is stronger than that. Remember that once you take that first step towards healthy eating, as long as you're eating a healthy and balanced diet where you are full at the end of your meals, your cravings will fall away. You will hit reset. When I get into that comfort and junk food loop and I drag myself out of it and I manage to force myself out of it and into eating whole foods again, it generally takes me a few days for the cravings to stop. Sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's a couple of weeks, particularly after, say, Christmas time, where I've been happily eating not so healthily for weeks on end. So in writing down what's stopping you, what's preventing you from getting going on your goals, remind yourself that by putting your mind and commitment into what you want, you will get past these blocks. If decluttering your home or your workspace is your goal, what's stopping you from getting on with that? Is it a sense of overwhelm? There's so much clutter you don't know where to start, and the discomfort of the overwhelm is stopping you from starting altogether. I'm going to take you through some steps on how you can overcome overwhelm and procrastination in a few moments, so hang tight for that. Or is it that you feel you don't have enough time? I'm going to help you with that too. What about meditating? Is it your goal to start a meditation practice? What do you feel is stopping you? Are you worried maybe that you won't be able to sit still for long enough, especially on the floor, cross-legged as they do on social media posts of people allegedly meditating? Or are you worried about the thoughts that might pop into your head if you were to give meditation a go? Perhaps you don't know how to meditate. I'm going to help you with that too. And if being calmer, more understanding and less reactive is something you want to achieve, write down one thing that is stopping you from starting on that journey. Is it that you don't know how to start? Is it that you maybe feel you can't achieve this intention? So you've identified your intention. You've written down on a piece of paper just one thing that's blocking you, that's stopping you from getting going with your intention or from achieving it. The third step is to make a plan. So in addition to telling your mind that you can and will overcome the hurdles, in addition to focusing positive thoughts and energies to yourself and to everything around you and everyone around you, what you actually do matters just as much. Envisioning the perfect boyfriend or girlfriend without more is not going to cause this person to fall into your lap. Daydreaming of a tidy and decluttered home is not going to cause magic dust to be sprinkled over your home whilst you sleep and Mary Poppins the clutter away. What you do matters in terms of taking steps to attain your intentions and in terms of being able to stick to your goals. And this is where you need to set in place the small chunk, bite-sized goals and steps about which I've spoken before. Now here comes the fun bit. Remember that second piece of paper I asked you to grab at the start of this show? Well, pick that up now and put it in front of you. And if you haven't grabbed your piece of paper yet, go do it now. Get a normal sized piece of paper that you would use to print documents on and grab a pen or a pencil. Put the piece of paper on its side lengthways, so horizontal, not vertical, or landscape, not portrait, for you artists out there. I want you to draw a large rectangle around the outside edge of your piece of paper. And then inside that rectangle, I want you to draw six evenly spaced out lines within the large box going from top to bottom. So once you've got your six evenly spaced out lines top to bottom, you should have seven columns now inside of your bigger rectangle. Those columns represent each day of the week, Monday through Sunday. So now draw a line at the top of your rectangle from left to right and write the days of the week along that top row. Once you've done that, within each column representing each day of the week, divide those columns up into rows. The rows stand for the time hour by hour, starting from the time you usually wake up to when you usually go to bed. That schedule may vary a little day to day and from between the weekdays and the week weekends. But for the purposes of this exercise, pick the same times every day for waking up and for going to sleep. 
So, for example, I would start with 6 a.m., that's when I generally wake up, and end with 9 p.m., that's when I generally try to go to sleep. Your rows on your piece of paper are likely to be quite tight, unless you have a, a bigger piece of paper, of course. But that doesn't matter, because I only want you to find 15 minutes within these rows of hours, but we'll get there shortly. So now you have a grid in front of you. You have the seven days of the week running along as columns left to right, and you have your 16 hours a day that you're awake running down in, top, in rows top to bottom, assuming you have eight hours down for sleep. Okay, so you've got your grid. I now want you to pick an intention, just one of your intentions. And with your newly mapped out schedule sheet in front of you, I want you to think about your non-negotiables. Those will be things like the school run, your job, your workout time, time spent cooking and eating. Taking all of those essentials out of your day, because you will need to do those come what may, on your newly mapped out grid schedule, try to find 15 minutes every other day, or even every day, where you can devote that 15 minutes to your intention. By mapping out your week in this grid format, you may even find that you have more 15 minutes slots available to you than you thought you had. So if your intention is to eat healthier, you can use the 15 minutes of one day to find or to devise your own eating plan and the 15 minutes of another day to compile your shopping list and perhaps 15 minutes of another day to come up with some additional tasty but healthy weekend treat meals and snack recipes. If it's decluttering your home or workspace and getting organised that you want to achieve, use each set of 15 minutes firstly to come up with a plan of action and then secondly chunks of it on executing that plan. Let's say you're going to start decluttering in your bedroom. That alone may still feel overwhelming, so narrow it down some more. Pick a particular closet, area or drawer and then hone it down some more again. Pick a certain section of your closet, area or drawer that you are going to start decluttering first. List different sections of your home in this way, narrowing it down as best as you can until you have the whole house covered. Let's take a kitchen drawer. I think we all have a, this may come in handy one day, drawer in our kitchens. These drawers tend to need fairly regular clear outs because they fill up quickly. So once you have your sectioned off, narrowed down lists of part of your home you wish to declutter, pick an area, for example, the kitchen drawer I just described. And maybe you used all of your 15 minute slots in your first week of this new plan to actually make your plan. So starting in the second week of your 15 minute slots, be they daily slots or once every other day, use those 15 minutes to start to execute the plan. Day one of your 15 minutes in the second week, you're clearing out the kitchen drawer, let's say. Day two, you're bringing your attention to the top storage shelf of your closet. And this may take up day three as well. And that's okay because you're making progress and you're doing it in bite-sized bite chunks. If your goal is to start a meditation practice, use your 15 minute slots for the first 21 days worth of 15 minute slots to start by having a gratitude practice. This will free up space in your mind and energy space that may currently be occupied by negative thoughts or feelings. One of the easiest ways to have a gratitude practice is to have a gratitude journal. I keep a little notebook beside my bed with a pen clipped to it. That way I have no excuse at the end of the day for not using the journal. Leave the gratitude journal open on the page that you're going to write on, making it even easier for you to just write. And as you're getting into bed, or maybe even if you're already in bed, Write down five things for which you are grateful from that day and be precise in exactly what it is that you are grateful for. I'm grateful for the sun is not precise enough. Instead, if it is the sun for which you are grateful, think about what in particular about the sun is making you feel grateful that day. Is it that the sunrise was breathtaking? Or perhaps the sunset had a beautiful hue? Or is it that there was a moment as you were getting out of your car or off the bus that you caught the sun on your back and it made you feel warm. And once that space in your life that once held negative thoughts, feelings and beliefs is freed up and replaced by positivity, a meditation practice will come more naturally. For instance, you can sit in, a, in quiet contemplation for your next set of 15 minutes or possibly longer, contemplating the things for which you are grateful, which is a form of meditation in itself. If your aim is to become calmer, more understanding and less reactive, Use some of your 15 minute slots to have a simple breath practice. This could be as simple as sitting on a chair 
and focusing on your breath in and focusing on your breath out. You may wish to try box breathing to four seconds each line of the box. With this, breathe in for four seconds, imagining a line being drawn left to right. Then hold your breath for four seconds, imagining a line being drawn top to bottom. Then breathe out for four seconds, visualizing a line being drawn right to left. And then hold your breath again, seeing in your mind's eye a line being drawn from bottom to top until you have completed a box in your mind. And you can repeat that two or three times. Another way to become calmer, more understanding and less reactive is to rewrite your script. You are the author of your own life, remember? So if you tend to react to people by saying, for example, you always or you never do something, whatever that something is, reframe that by choosing the words, when you didn't do whatever it was, it made me feel however it made you feel. So, for example, you're never there for me could be re-scripted as, that time when I asked you to come with me to the doctor and you said you were too busy, it made me feel like you didn't care about me and I felt sad. And you can use your 15 minute slots to write yourself a little cheat sheet of reactive sentences on the left hand side with a corresponding non-reactive phrase on the right. This cheat sheet can serve as an aid memoir and a reminder for your new life script. And now for those of you who have diligently maintained your practices and held your regular check-ins with yourselves, I want you guys, I want you guys to stop what you're doing right now, unless you're driving. In that case, please keep driving. I want you to stop what you're doing and I want you to give yourselves a big round of applause. That's right, belt it out. Give yourselves a big, huge clap for managing for over three months to stick to being there for yourself, to maintaining steps towards self-improvement and betterment. And for those of you who are halfway between the two stages of not having set your intentions and having tightly followed your plans, you deserve a round of applause too. So go ahead, give yourselves a big clap and a big whoop. If setting intentions or if going for what we really desire is something that is actually causing us fear or anxiety, I want to help you to use that fear as fuel. But first, what is fear and what causes us to be fearful? So what is fear? I've discussed this on previous shows, saying that fear is very much a natural and normal part of us being human. Our ancestors' fear of being eaten by wild animals and taking steps to prevent that from happening means that we are all here and alive now. Fear helps us to prepare for and react to dangers and threats, so fear is not a bad thing. And what causes fear is directly related to what it is. Simply put, a threat or a perceived threat is what causes the fear to manifest in the first place. As modern day humans, we can embrace that fear reaction. Whilst most of us don't have wild animals that we need to make sure don't eat us, the fear reaction can still serve its purpose for us. We can turn fear on its head. We can use it as a catalyst to action if used in the right way. What I mean by this is, rather than allowing any fear we may be feeling, rather than allowing that to debilitate us, rather than allowing that fear to prevent us from taking action, from taking the next steps, we can use that fear reaction to identify what exactly it is that is causing us to be fearful or what exactly it is that's causing us to feel anxious. From the perspective of setting intentions and goals, if we are feeling fearful about taking the next step, we need to identify where exactly this fear is coming from. Are we fearful of what the future may hold as regards this goal? For instance, are we fearful that we may not achieve our goal? Or are we imagining a future, a negative future, a future that hasn't even happened yet? A future we have no way of knowing whether it will happen because, well, because it's in the future and therefore it hasn't happened. Your goal might be to apply for a different job. And maybe you're feeling fearful or anxious that you'll not get the job, that you'll be rejected. Or you may be imagining a future where you do get the job, but you end up hating it or you don't get on with your colleagues. The saying that fear... F-E-A-R is an acronym for false evidence appearing real is not only true, but actually a really helpful approach for tackling situations that are making us feel fearful or anxious. What we can do with fear is that we can identify where that fear is coming from, identify what's causing that fear. And then by doing that, we are more than halfway towards getting rid of that fear or anxiety. We are closer to turning the fear on its head and using it as a springboard for the next step we need to take, whatever that step might be. Let's take moving house as an example. 
The process of moving house can feel scary and overwhelming. If you have accumulated a lot of things over time, come the task of packing up and moving house, you may actually be pretty terrified. But with these types of situations, almost 99% of the time we end up creating a monster in our own minds of what the future will actually hold. The false evidence in our minds ends up appearing real. Until we actually do the research, put a CV together and apply for that job, the fear monster is real. And once we've made that application, we may even get that job. And if not that job, then the next one or the one after that. And on this one, one thing to remember about fear of not getting the job or whatever it might be, which is essentially the fear of rejection, is that life is full of rejections. Rejection is inevitable. When I was a teenager and had decided to enter legal practice as a barrister in England, someone very helpfully told me that I would very likely apply for around 400 work experience positions called mini pupillages. Of those, four may reply to say, thank you for your application, but we're full. Or, thank you for your application, but you don't have the experience we need you to have. And one of the 400 might reply to say, thank you for your application, when can you come in? Now those numbers may be exaggerated or they may be absolutely spot on depending on your industry. Either way, I'm so grateful to this person and I sadly forget who it was, but I'm so grateful to them for telling me that. I have carried this bit of advice with me since then and I know that if I want to go for something, I should just go for it. And if it's a no, then a yes will eventually come along if I just keep asking. There's probably some kind of law of probability in that too. And with the moving house example, we build up in our minds this monster of a mammoth task that needs to be undertaken. But by going back to my three-step plan and getting the task down to manageable chunks, whilst you will need to spend more than 15 minutes a day packing up and moving, by cutting the task into pieces of manageable chunks, it gets done. And there you have the false evidence appearing real. Once we start the task, once we make the application, or once we start packing up, what then follows is very rarely, if ever, as bad as our minds had previously allowed us to believe it would be. And in any event, a failed job application or a stressful house move will, in a few weeks, months or years' time, be completely forgotten about, so it's unlikely that it's going to have any lasting impact. I speak about finding our true life's purpose on my third show. Jay Shetty says the following in his book, Think Like a Monk. We fear the stresses and challenges of change, but those stresses and challenges are the wind that makes us stronger. And I think that this applies to a lot of us in finding our purpose. Are we fearful that we may never find our purpose so we don't even try? And the same is true of setting intentions and goals. Are we so afraid that we won't meet our own targets or that we will be rejected that we don't even try in the first place? If so, we are missing out on giving ourselves a chance at success. And we are also missing out on the chance of becoming stronger as a result of the failures. Shetty continues in his book, If we can stop viewing the stress and the fear that accompanies this as negative, and instead see the potential benefits, we are on our way to changing our relationship with fear. Fear becomes a huge hindrance when it has the effect of overwhelming and paralyzing us from taking action on something that we want to achieve or from putting an intention into place that we want to achieve. Learning to conquer and overcome fear is therefore a great skill to have. I've talked about identifying the fear already. The next thing to do is to bring ourselves back into the shared human experience and not to separate ourselves or hold ourselves out as being alone or the first or the only person to whom this is happening who is feeling fear about, for example, moving house, applying for a new job or of public speaking. By re-identifying, by bringing ourselves back to the shared common human experience, that one time or another, we all experience these kinds of fears. It helps us to be more compassionate to ourselves and through self-compassion we can work through our fears. For example, if the fear is one of public speaking and we acknowledge that it's okay to have that fear and that we're not alone in this fear. In fact, I think, don't, don't quote me on this, but I think there's a study out there somewhere which says that most of us fear public speaking more than we fear dying. That's pretty intense. For sticking with the fear of public speaking as our example, once we have identified that that is our fear, 
And having identified that we are not alone in this and that we deserve some self-compassion, we can start to take active steps to conquering our fear. Some of the ways in which we can do this is to realise that most of us are actually getting stuck into public speaking much more than we realise. We speak to people we don't know frequently. At the grocery store, in the flower shop, at our kids' school talking to their teachers. Many of us already give presentations, formal or informal, in front of our colleagues at work. Interviewing or being the interviewer for a position at a job is a form of public speaking. And those are just a few examples. Once we have worked out that we actually already do a bit of public speaking, it makes something like giving a speech a little less scary. And we can start by, say, delivering a talk to a small select audience, perhaps our friends who will be positive and supportive and will give us constructive feedback. Having done that, we can start to increase the size of our audience, conquering our fears bit by bit, step by step. Remaining with the public speaking example, but these ideas work for most things. In addition to practicing, we will want to turn any negative thoughts around the topic into positive thoughts, maybe through reciting some positive, encouraging affirmation in the days in the lead up to the speech or presentation or or whatever the event might be. Some positive affirmations can be found on the Spirituality and Health website in an article called 20 Affirmations for Public Speaking with Ease by Catherine Drury Wagner. Three of my favourites are I have so much to say and I cannot wait to share it. Another one is Words and thoughts come effortlessly to me. And another one I am sincere with my words and there will be great results from what I have to say. And if it is public speaking that you're trying to get on top of, check out my show notes to the podcast for the link to this online article, as the other affirmations up there are pretty cool too, and I would love for you guys to see them. Staying with public speaking, another way in which we can conquer our fears around something like that is to speak to someone who has been where we are now. And again, this applies to anything, to a job or an industry or a skill. If there is someone you look up to and admire and you want to emulate, then see if you can speak to them and get their advice and words of wisdom and encouragement to help you achieve your goals. Get a coach, for example. Do online classes. Do other skill-building practices. Fear is a natural reaction to a threat. It's when it becomes a hindrance and a block to achieving our goals and dreams that it becomes a problem. But with the right tools, encouragement and positive attitude, Fear towards achieving a goal or setting an intention is most certainly something we can all overcome. In concluding today, I took you through some of the mental health issues that we can all face at times such as Easter or the holidays generally, and what we can do to help ourselves with these. I then looked at Easter being a time of resurrection and it being a time for renewal, rebirth, new things, especially with it being springtime now. Following on from my Christmas special episode on setting intentions, I took you through a cool little step-by-step guide on identifying your intentions, identifying what may be holding you back from getting going with them, and then I helped you to set out a plan on how to achieve your goals. And with the piece of paper that you have with your grid on it, you can of course transfer that into something more sophisticated, be it electronic, so that you can update it as you go, and you can have one for every week. And for those of you listening on the radio who want to come back and do the exercise of planning out your week to find 15-minute slots in which you can conquer the world, check out my podcast for your replay of this show, which lands every Tuesday at 6am Eastern Standard Time on Spotify, Apple, Google and other platforms. I then talked about using fear as fuel in the context of fuel for making changes, for setting new intentions, either because you didn't get round to it at the end of last year or because, having set intentions for yourself then, you realise that they weren't the right ones for you and you want to have a crack at some new ones. If any of the topics that I have discussed today have affected you, please reach out to someone, whether that's a friend or to someone professional. Infinite Mind Care here in the Cayman Islands provides counselling services and they can be found on 926-0882. The Alex Panton Foundation offers support to people up to the age of 30 and their website is alexpantonfoundation.ky. The Wellness Centre here in Cayman may be reached on 949-9355 and Loud Silent Voices also provides mental health support. Their number is 922-3847 and their email is info at lsv.support. Tune in to my show Shuvra Deb with you every Thursday at 2pm right here on Bobo FM 89.1 in the Cayman Islands. 
And for those of you listening on the podcast, which is available on Spotify, Apple, Google and other platforms, for you guys, if you want to catch my show as it drops first here on the radio, be sure to tune in. If you are listening on the podcast and you would like and you like what you hear, please rate, follow, review and share my show. I'd be so grateful to you for doing that. All of you can find me on the radio live and online every Thursday at 2pm on Bobo FM 89.1 at dmsbroadcasting.ky. Thank you for listening. See you next time. Bye for now. The Shuvra Deb With You podcast is inspired and brought to you by Shuvra Deb. Copyright Shuvra Deb. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for listening to Shuvra Deb with you. And please do tune in every Thursday at 2pm on Bobo FM 89.1 for more topics related to and relevant to mental health. If any of you would like to reach out to me directly about any of the issues I've discussed, please do email me at shuvradeb82 at gmail.com that's spelt S-H-U-V-R-A-D-E-B the numbers 82 at gmail.com Thank you so much for tuning in and listening.